My name is Kemper Simpich, and I have spent the last 12 years honing my photography craft in the mountains of Colorado and the American West. In that time, I have used many cameras from a variety of brands and have learned the ins and outs of setting up and using those cameras to create amazing images of the natural world. In this video, we are going in depth on the Sony a7R5, Sony's 61 megapixel powerhouse. This video is not a review or opinion piece, rather it is a walkthrough of the entire landscape photography process using the Sony a7R5 as a centerpiece. Welcome to the a7R5 guide for landscape photography. I am so excited to be making this guide here in the beautiful San Juan Mountains of Colorado. What is this guide and what can you expect over the next <laughs> probably several hours? I don't know how these things seem to be several hours long, so we'll see how that turns out. But so what can you expect? So what I'm trying to do in this video is to take you through the entire landscape photography experience with the Sony a7R5. Uh, we are going to do a walkthrough of the camera. We are going to do a dive of the menus. We're going to, uh, you know, I'm going to go over all the settings that I use for landscape photography. Uh, we're going to be in the field here in the San Juan Mountains shooting photographs with the camera. I'm going to be walking you through a lot of my process with shooting it. And then we are going to jump into my studio and do edits of some of the photos that we're going to be capturing uh, today and tomorrow. So. Um, actually, right now, we're getting some uh, really cool pictures of snuffles here. So for this guide, I'm going to be featuring two lenses. Uh, the first lens is the 7200 f4 macro that was just released in 2023. I'm very excited. I'm getting to know that lens, uh, really enjoying it. I'm actually, uh, if you can come here, here for composition. So what I'm doing right now we have a lot of clouds kind of rolling in over the mountain and I'm really enjoying some of the stuff that it's doing interesting compositions here in this portrait format. And I'm exposing, that was maybe a little underexposed. In this kind of situation, it's very tricky because you have low area, right? Where the sun's not hitting and then you have direct sunlight up on the summit and on the clouds and the direct sunlight on the clouds makes them very <laughs> um, easy to clip or lose information in because it's overexposed. So in this case, I'm watching my histogram here. So the meter is saying I'm actually underexposed a little bit. It's saying uh, minus 0.3, but the histogram says that everything is ex exposed. So the right-hand side of the histogram is where my highlights are, okay? And if it's butting up against it, that means that it's overexposed for the highlights. I've lost information in my brights. And then the left side, of course, is the darks. I'm not as interested in the darks. A little bit of dark clipping doesn't make as big a difference. I mean, you don't want to do a bunch, but I can see right now that I'm not clipping my lights. I'm not clipping my darks. So I'm actually going to lower my shutter speed a little tiny bit to 1 1 20th of a second because I do want to try to have as much dynamic range as possible. So this histogram right here, uh, I know it's sideways, so it's a little difficult to see. This histogram right here is about as good as I'm going to get for this situation where I'm not butting against either sign. So I'm going to take the shot and I'm just going to take several shots right now as the clouds kind of roll in. I just bumped it. <laughs> As the clouds kind of roll in above Snuffles, I'm just gonna try to find a composition that I like. Uh, I'm doing one of my trademark mountain centered in the middle of the frame that uh, I do so often. I put the summit right in the middle. Uh, not following the rule of thirds, but I'm actually, in this situation at sunset, when you're shooting a sunset like this, particularly this time of year, uh, we're shooting here in very late summer, so your golden hours are actually quite a bit shorter, so the light actually changes quicker. Um, like in the middle of the summer, your golden hours, actually my composition's looking really cool right now. I've got to watch my exposure. But when you are in a situation like this, where you are shooting, the light is changing second by second. 
you do have to watch your shutter speed because that's probably the setting that you're going to change, right? You're gonna, you're gonna set your aperture um, for your focus. You're gonna set your aperture for sharpness on a particular lens. Right now I'm at F8. Uh, with this lens, I could probably go down to 5.6 and I actually think I will so that I don't have to put the two second timer yet. So that's what I, where I was going is that you have to be careful to not be essentially, you want to have your two second timer on if your shutter speed gets too long. So as you reduce that shutter speed, kind of be careful to watch it. I'm gonna just, oh yeah, right there like that. I think that's really nice. Let's, I kind of want to get the right side of the cloud in. I want to get this whole cloud formation in, but I really like what the color's doing here. I really like right now that the whole frame feels very full. This bottom part is dark. Um, I'm gonna see in the edit if I keep that bottom part dark. Um, I think I probably will, but I really like how the clouds are helping really fill the frame here right now. So I'm at 100 millimeters. I'm gonna move it over. I'm at 100 millimeters right now. And I like, I can see, it's maybe a little bit difficult to see on the YouTube video, but I am flashing up the photos. Uh, there's kind of a diagonal of this hill in front that I think adds some. But I like how this cloud, and I'm just kind of moving with the cloud right now. I'm not taking a panorama, I'm taking single shots. But I like how the cloud is helping me fill the entire frame with content. And also we're seeing the color change quite a bit. So we've kind of entered true sunset here. It's, yeah, literally like sunsets in like five minutes. So you can see the color starts to change. Um, I think I'm gonna speed up my shutter a little bit to make sure I'm maximizing the color info. And just because I want to be thorough with the situation. I'm going to go into landscape mode. Actually, this is really cool. I'm liking this. And take some shots. I feel like this could actually make a really cool panorama. So, uh, so far this uh, small rig thing is getting a great review from me. I'm really liking it. So we're gonna do a panorama. I'm gonna base my exposure settings on my subject, which is Snuffles in this case. So as I move over here, they may change slightly, but in a panorama, I always base my settings on the subject. And I'm just going to kind of move across here. And then we'll merge this panorama in the editing section. Okay, this is one of those things where it just pays to kind of keep, keep moving through a scene because what we're getting here is we've got this cloud coming up around Snuffles. So I'm gonna try to experiment and find a way to make that cloud because it's kind of coming in this like almost curve around it. Now I am losing light on Snuffles. So we're working as quick as we can. But now I'm very zoomed in, I'm at 135. Um, on this 7200, which, oh, this one's cool. This one's cool, guys. I think I like it. So here's a, here's a, here's a hot tip, a hot tip, while I'm still continuing to try to get this shot. I'm a little underexposed. I'm gonna bring it back up 
a little bit of my exposure. So I, even while I'm using a zoom lens, I try my very best to shoot at set focal lengths. Um, and I do this for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one is, is that <laughs> it honestly helps me know what primes <laughs> I might want at some point, like a 135. I genuinely, I've, I've owned the Sony 135. I don't have it right now, but I've owned it. And I love that lens. Um, and part of the reason I know that I love it is that I shoot, um, I'm gonna take a single shot now. So I am gonna zoom out and kind of work on that composition. So, and I'm in between now. So I don't always do that, but I like starting at those focal lengths. As you do that, as you go through that process of shooting at set focal lengths on a lens, you zoom around, but you kind of learn your focal lengths. So it becomes part of the process of shooting. You're like, okay, I think I wanna do 135 right now. And it helps you have a starting point as you kind of learn how the different focal lengths look. I definitely let my exposure creep down. I'm about to stop underexposed right now, which I think is fine because where I'm concerned about losing detail is in the clouds. So the more leeway I'm giving myself up there, the better. I'm the, the darks, I'm not that concerned. I'm not, I don't think I'm gonna bring them up. And you can literally watch live. I think we're gonna get our last bit of light on Sneffels. As you can see, this is a really valuable resource um, if you are interested in shooting landscape photography with the A7R5. Um, these guides tend to run multiple hours long and I doubt that this guide is going to be any different. So how can you support us? Well, the first and easiest way is to like this video and subscribe to this channel. Um, it really does help us build out this channel that is, is featuring a lot of outdoor photography, landscape photography, outdoor video, adventure video, we are doing a lot with this with this channel and we are really excited we're investing a lot into it and we think you're going to love some of the stuff that we have in the pipeline so liking and subscribing and hitting the notification bell for when you see new videos go up is extremely helpful to us let's do a quick walkthrough of the sony a7r5 we're going to walk through the controls the buttons and the different aspects of this camera that you need to know to operate it. <laughs> so the first and most important thing is the putting the lens on. So there's a little catch on the lower right hand side. You turn it this way and as you can see I have the shutter protecting the sensor which I will show you how to do in the menu section. Turn that on. Super important. So that's how you put a lens on. Now something that you're going to notice about the Sony a7R5 is that the controls are very right hand uh, oriented. So it really, this camera is designed to be able to do almost everything with the right hand. So we're gonna start with the all important shutter button, which is wrapped uh, with the on off switch. So you turn it on right there, turn it off, super simple. Um, there, right behind there, you have two buttons you have C2 and the movie record button. C stands for custom, so it's custom to and movie record button. This movie record button is also a custom button in stills. So we're going to be using, uh, in the walkthrough, I mean, excuse me, in the menu walkthrough, we'll be customizing these buttons and I'll be showing you how I have them set up. Uh, behind that, we have the mode dial. So we have manual, shutter priority, aperture priority, program, auto, and then you have three custom modes. I pretty much live in manual anymore, especially on these Sony cameras. It's very, uh, uh, they make it pretty easy to live in manual. Uh, then you have, you can switch between photo and video uh, because this is a landscape uh, guide. We're not gonna be covering settings that don't really apply to landscape specifically. So um, I'll just kind of get that out of the way right off the bat that 
Like I'm not gonna be covering video settings uh, and then I'm only gonna be covering autofocus settings in as they apply to landscape photography and autofocus is not super complicated for landscape photography. So if you're looking for autofocus guide, uh, in-depth autofocus guide, this probably isn't going to be your video, but I will cover it to some degree. And I do have ways that I use autofocus and tricks of the trade. So it's probably worth your time. So, okay, coming to the back of the camera, the top of the camera again, um, you have two dials. Uh, oh, I did, I missed the dial right here. That is the a first command dial that's on the front, front command dial. You have another one right here. So typically these are shutter speed and aperture or aperture and shutter speed is customizable. And then over here, you have a super cool dial that is customizable as well, but it has a lock on it. So spoiler alert, I have that set to ISO and I love having it on ISO. So uh, as we move to the back of the camera now, you have C1, you have a row of three buttons here. You have C1, AF on, and AEL. So basically C1 and AEL I treat, uh, AEL stands for auto exposure lock. Um, that's not how we use it. So, but that's what that stands for. So you have C1, a, uh, AF on, AEL. Um, you have the function button. So that pulls up a function menu on the back screen. Here, I'll demo that. Pulls up this customizable function menu. You have the joystick right here which you can click in as another custom button, which I have set to just center the autofocus point. Then you have the rear command dial. So there are a lot of dials on this camera and a running theme uh, while I'm talking about this camera is just how customizable Sony has made this camera. There's so many, not only is there a lot of controls, actual controls on the camera, but they are all super customizable and it's, it's fantastic. It's, it's a fun camera to use and it's fun to kind of customize it and make it your own. So, and I'm part of this, this guide is going to be giving you the tools to really make this camera your own. So you have this uh, rear command dial and what's more is that there's four custom things that you can do on there. And there's a center button too. So. Here's where you view the images. There's an image I just took. And there's C4 slash trash can. We, I just use that as a custom button, um, which I'm not able to right now because it's in, I have it set to uh, uh, zoom in focus. So, and then on the, just to finish up with our buttons, we have two buttons on the left-hand side. We have C3 and the menu button. And so C3 is another custom button. And then of course the menu button, which is pretty straightforward. Okay, memory cards. So on the right hand side, you have a little lock here. It's up and down. That opens up the two memory card slots. So the A7R5 can take two types of memory cards. It can take SD cards, uh, SDXC cards. It can also take CF Express Type A cards, which is the smaller CF Express card for landscape photography. Now in the uh, accessories section where I kind of been going over the accessories that I have for this camera, I'm gonna talk about specific cards, but for landscape photography, I don't see a big reason to uh, use the CF Express Type A cards. They're very expensive they, for the amount of storage that you have and the workflow is more complicated, the readers are hard to get and expensive. I just, if you're using this mainly for landscape photography, I do not think that that is a necessary expense to take on. So I just have two identical pro grade cobalt cards in here. And I'll be talking about my memory card workflow in the accessory section. So stay tuned for that. So that's where the memory cards are at. Now we have the, well, let's talk about how you view what you're taking with this camera. So you have a, a uh, nine point something, I'll flash up on the screen, a nine point something million dot EVF that is an absolute brilliant joy to use. It's so sharp and I just, I love taking pictures with this EVF, even though I'm taking it with a tripod a lot of the time, like I was earlier. The rear screen here, which is also a big improvement from Sony, it's a lot sharper, um, 
it has two modes. So you have your normal uh, articulating screen like this. So this is very typical for the A7R4, the A1, the, there's a lot of Sony cameras that are just like this. So, but it also is fully articulating like this. So you can film yourself. There's all kinds of configurations that you can put this in. You can have it pulled out and like this, um, if you're on a tripod, you can have it like this, which is super handy. You can also close it to cover it, to protect it, which is uh, very handy. So that is the EVF and the rear screen. So for on the left side of the camera, you have your mic in port, you have headphone in port, you have HDMI, uh, you have your full size HDMI, you have a USB-C, <laughs> it's hard to see, it's getting dark. And then you have a uh, multi interface port, which I don't even know what you use that for anymore. Um, for landscape photography, main one you're gonna be using is USB-C. You also have full size HDMI and a, that's an old flash sync port. Okay, so that was a walkthrough of the controls. Uh, Toby and I are going to be setting up camp uh, down the road there, but you are going to jump into the Summit Biz Studio and we're going to dive into the menus now. Okay, we are going to dive into customizing and setting up the Sony a7R5 for landscape photography. So before I dive into the menus, I need to do a couple of, I, I guess you call them asterisks or just notes for you before we do this. One, I'm setting up this camera for landscape photography. This camera does a lot of things that are not landscape photography. And I just think it's really important to off the bat, in the interest of time, I'm really gonna be focusing on the settings that matter to get you out in the field shooting landscape photography. Um, I really am a huge believer in setting up my cameras for what I'm actually shooting. So I'll sometimes have multiple setups if I'm shooting a different thing, but I don't wanna futz around with settings that aren't relevant to what I'm shooting. So that's what I'm gonna help you set up your A7R5 to do today. I understand that means that I'm not gonna cover a lot of the autofocus settings because there's a lot to cover in autofocus with this camera. This camera does so much. So that's the first note that I wanted to kind of share with you. The second note, and probably the more important note, is, is that this is the most customizable camera I've ever used. Uh, Sony has taken the customization of their cameras to the stratosphere, in my opinion everything can be changed on this camera. At least it feels like everything can be changed on this camera. The only thing that doesn't seem to be able to be changed is that I can't look at the menu on the back screen and have it recording to an external recorder at the same time. So that's why we have this kind of odd looking setup here is because I have to look at the external recorder to be able to do it at the same time. So that's kind of a funny little quirk, but this camera is so customizable. It's, you can, and, and that's what I'm gonna want, I wanna encourage you to do. I'm gonna share with you the settings and how I have it set up, but I'm really gonna encourage you to just use that as a jumping off place, because I think that you're gonna be able to figure out a setup that is better for you. Who knows, it might be better for me. Yeah, you can share it in the comments if you find something that you think would be super valuable. But yeah, this is the most customizable camera I've ever used and I'm just, I, I'm excited to dive on in. So, like I said, we're just covering landscape photography settings and it's really, it's kind of a jumping off place for your customizable creativity. So let's, with that, let's go. Okay, so the ways, these are, this is the new generation of Sony menus and this top menu is your my menu so you can add things here that you want to quickly reference um, we're not going to do that right now but this is where you do that uh, this thing is called main I, I, main i don't really use this i have not really used this it seems to me like it's a quick uh touch friendly area to change settings 
So that's really nice. It doesn't appear to be customizable unless there's something I'm totally missing. Like I've been using this camera for several months now and have not found, and I honestly, I just haven't used it. As a matter of fact, I kind of forgot it was there until I jumped into this menu and I'm like, oh yeah, there's this thing. So anyway, it's, you know, there's lots of quick settings here. You can change the image quality settings real quickly. So that's nice. Um, aspect ratio you can change quickly, so that's nice. Uh, drive mode, so it's kind of a quick place to change settings. I It doesn't feel quicker to me than the function menu, but you know, uh, to each their own. So, okay, without further ado, here we're going into the shooting. This is where we're really starting to get into the meat of the settings here. Um, image quality uh, record settings, uh, JPEG or Heath, that's just your personal preference if you record one of those and things. I don't record, I'm a raw recorder only. So I'm just gonna jump straight down to image quality settings. And here I'm selecting the file format. Now you would be able to do raw, raw plus J, and raw and JPEG or JPEG. I'm doing just raw. And then the raw file type. So I do uncompressed. This is going to be a personal preference thing because there is lossless compressed large now as well as medium and small. And the medium and small literally drop the megapixels. This is a landscape photography guide, so we're not, we don't want to do that. But you can do lossless compressed or uncompressed. Lossless compressed technically shouldn't, you, you should have all of your data, but just because for my peace of mind, I wanna feel like I'm absolutely maximizing image quality in this amazing camera, I do uncompressed. So uh, if you really want to save space or you're going on a big trip and you feel like you need a lot of space, go ahead and do the lossless compressed. Um, just don't do the compressed, there's no reason. So you can shortcut to record media settings here, which we're going to do just for the interest of time. And I'm pretty straightforward here. Um, in the accessories section where I'm talking about the memory cards, I'm going to explain my workflow for how I do memory cards, but it's very important that you have it set to simultaneous recording. And this top one is the photo simultaneous recording. I also simultaneous record video, but uh, you may not need to worry about that. So um, auto switch media, that's not really relevant because I'm actually not sure why that's on because I'm recording to both cards for backup purposes. And, you know, again, that's a personal preference thing, but when we get to where I talk about what memory cards I use, I will explain my workflow with memory cards, and I think I'll sell you on doing simultaneous backup recording. So aspect ratio, there you can change that here. You can change that lots of places. Um, we're gonna keep just going down. Uh, color space. Oh, high ISO noise reduction. We, uh, normal is probably decent for landscape. Um, color space, Adobe RGB. Um, this really, because you shoot raw, it doesn't super matter. It's really just how you're viewing the images on the back of the camera. So if you want the color to look similar uh, on the back of the camera. I mean, it really, it doesn't change that much, but I change it to Adobe RGB just to maximize uh, compatibility there. Okay, so that, all right, so media, we've really covered that already because there was a shortcut file. Um, there's one quick thing I do change here in the top item file folder settings. I change the file name to A7R that's because I use quite a few different cameras and it's very helpful to be able to quickly see that a image I took was taken with the A7R just based on the file name. You don't have to change that if you don't want to, or you can put your initials or some other identifying feature there. So, um, you can select record number, a uh, record folder, um, you can, Here's where you can change your copyright info, which I do recommend doing. So that's written into the metadata of a of the file. So you can set the photographer. 
I'm Kemper Simpich, and I also own the copyright. So you can change that. Um, shooting mode. So these settings here are a somewhat redundant thing. All of this stuff you're able to do other places. And it's easier to do it in the context of other places with the exception of you, this is where you can set your camera me memory settings on the top of the camera, which um, I don't use as much as I used to. Back when these cameras were less customizable than they are now, I did change, you know, custom setting one, two, and three. I don't really do that anymore. I don't feel like I need to because I can change the settings so quickly with the custom buttons and the function menus and all that stuff. So this is where you set that if you would like to, but I don't really feel the need to anymore. And um, you can register that custom shoot set right here. Okay, drive mode. Again, this is something that you'll probably change in the field on the fly on the back of the camera. So all of this stuff, um, silence shutter. Um, one thing is you do want mechanical shutter and electronic front curtain shutter. Uh, I would definitely turn that on. That reduces shutter shock, um, makes the camera quieter. So I would turn that on. Uh, image stabilization, just with Sony cameras, I have found that this is a, you can leave it on setting, even for extremely long shutter speeds. It's very smart uh, with the uh, internal in-body image stabilization. So with Sony cameras, I've always just kind of turned it on and left it on. And the image stabilization on the A7R5 is outstanding. So definitely have that on. And all of this stuff, the grid line display, I, Sometimes I use it, but most of the time I have been leaving it off. I found that I've been kind of honing my compositions better without the grid lines. But if you do want your grid lines, you can turn them on here. And then you can also select the type. Um, there's a square grid and a diagonal plus square grid. Um, but the rule of thirds is probably the most useful there. So that kind of does it for our first shooting menu. Let's head down to exposure and color. This is a interesting little setting here. This is where you do the bulb timer settings. So this is new on the Sony a7R5 from other Sony's to at least my knowledge, but you can now change the, uh, basically how long the shutter goes when you set it to bulb mode. So. Um, you can turn it on, right? The bulb timer, and then you can set the exposure time. So basically what Sony's done is a super roundabout way of having super long shutter speeds without needing a remote or various other methods of getting super long shutter speeds. Normally you would set it to bulb, which means that you have to press it, press the shutter button on a remote to get it to stop. Now you can set it for how up to 900 seconds in bulb mode. Um, I have it randomly set to 60 seconds. I guess that was the last one I was using. Uh, so yeah, this is one of those settings that I would actually probably recommend moving into your custom menu, your my menu, because this is something that you will have to dive into the menus to change. So I would maybe recommend doing that. Um, ISO. Um, we live at 100 generally, but you can set the limit here, change it here. Here's where you can set the range limit. Um, actually, I'm gonna just do 100. I don't really like those extended. They kind of just clutter it up. And the maximum on this camera uh, that I would think is 12,800 is not terrible but I'm gonna do 6,400. I just, when I do set it into auto ISO, I don't want it jumping clear up to 12,800. I mean, really 3,200 would be the most I would want, but I guess I want the option there to go to 6,400. Again, landscape photography, I'm very rarely moving off of 100, 200 range, uh, just the way that I shoot. So uh, that's helpful. So, but now that I changed the range limits where it starts at 100, 
I no longer have to deal with those kind of those 50, those little ones with the lines on the top and the bottom. So that's helpful for just producing clutter. Okay, exposure compensation. Uh, don't really need to change anything here. Metering, don't need to change anything here. White balance. Okay, let's go ahead and adjust a couple settings with white balance. Um, auto white balance is fine, in my opinion, on this camera. I definitely shift into daylight sometimes, particularly if I'm shooting sunrises or sunsets. I feel like I get a little richer color uh, in daylight white balance. It, it doesn't, try, it, 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 it's a little more saturated and, and fuller color in daylight uh, auto balance. Uh, in daylight white balance, sorry. So I leave it in auto. However, you can set a priority here. This is a nice setting here. So essentially you can change, uh, you can kind of maintain ambience or you can have it zero out to white a little more aggressively. So I just leave it in standard. So ambience is maybe a little warmer, a little warmer. It's trying to, it's not necessarily saying like, oh, I think that's white, so I'm gonna turn it to white. It's, it's trying to read the scene and maintain a little bit of that, uh, that ambience. I mean, it's literally calls it ambience. So, um, and then if you really want to make sure that your whites are white, like your white clouds are white, you can change that to here. Honestly, standard does the job generally speaking. So that's where we're gonna keep it. Um, color and tone. Here's a big one, guys. Here's a big one. Turn off dynamic range optimizer. So this is just a funny, quirky Sony thing that in, you can turn it, okay. I will do a caveat. If you are shooting JPEGs, turn this on. For sure, turn this on because it will, it will uh, increase the dynamic range of your final images. So if you are someone who's shooting JPEG landscape photography, I don't know who you are, I'd like to talk to you, but uh, if you are someone who shoots JPEG landscape photography, then turn this on. If you are literally anybody else, turn this off immediately. Because what it's gonna do is it's going to throw off, it's on the back screen, it's going to show you a higher dynamic range image than what you're actually capturing. And it's gonna throw off, if you if you look at your back screen, if you reference your back screen for exposure, which you totally should, turn this off immediately because it's gonna make you, it's going to give you a false sense of what you're actually capturing, particularly with your highlights and your shadows. You're gonna, you're, it's, it's, if you want an educated, a more educated look at what you're actually capturing, you need to turn this off and what's worse is, is that even if you have this on and you're capturing an image, when you look at the image, when you press the play button to look at the image, it will show you that higher dynamic range image. It really is, it's not a good implementation. It's on by default, turn it off. So yeah, uh, creative look. Um, the only ones I use here are standard and then I will occasionally shoot look at the black and white. So, um, and I got into, so with creative look, just living in standard is, is a smart plan and then changing over to black and white when you want to kind of compose and expose for black and white photography, it's a good idea. Um, zebra display, I don't really use this. You can use this to um, kind of figure out where your, uh, where you might be clipping I use just the histogram, so um, you that that's a that's something you could use if you wanted to, but we're not going to worry about that. All right, we are in focus mode. So, um, Sony cameras with their focus, I have found that generally speaking, staying in AFC is like the most accurate way to focus with Sony cameras. So with back button autofocus, which is what we're gonna set up as we continue to go, um, literally in just a second, we're going to be setting up back button autofocus. Um, you don't need, you don't need AF single. 
but there is one scenario where you do, and we're gonna to get to that in a minute. So you're gonna to need to be able to change to AF uh, single AFS in a certain scenario. Uh, but generally speaking, you can live in continuous autofocus. Um, balanced emphasis. Uh, I go ahead and change this to AF. This is not what you wanna do. You do not wanna do this if you are doing other types of photography, but we're shooting landscape photography. We're fully committing to doing landscape photography. Um, so set it to AF. Basically what that means is that it's going to be more interested in being accurate than it is going to be in, in releasing the shutter. So we want to maximize that accuracy. So uh, AF tracking sensitivity, I mean, we don't need to. AF illuminator, that's the light that shines. Please turn that off. So, um, aperture drive and AF, that's fine. AF with shutter. So, this is where we start the process of converting this camera to fully back button autofocus. So, essentially what that means is that if you half press the shutter, you can autofocus. Because we're shooting most of the time in continue autofocus, Generally, this is something like uh, with the Nikon uh, cameras, I've said, you know, take it or leave it, do whatever you want. With the Sony, because we shoot in and continue with autofocus most of the time, I would recommend going ahead and turning this off and only using the AF on to engage autofocus. Um, Full-time DMF, this means basically you can rotate the focus ring to, uh, uh, basically manual focus whenever you want. Uh, don't really, haven't had a need to do that, so we're gonna leave that off. Um, focus area, okay. The spot. So the main thing that we're going to be doing here is we're gonna be changing the focus area limit. I only have two selected, two. And I'm gonna show you why in a minute, but I only have two selected and that's wide and spot small. So those are the only two autofocus areas that I have set up on this camera. Of course, there's a myriad here. You, you're welcome to have other ones, but these are the only two that I really find necessary in landscape photography. Um, if I can't use the spot, then the wide does the trick. And really, I could almost get rid of the wide um, but I have some special circumstances. I'm doing thumbnails. I'm shooting my uh, fellow photographers quite a bit. So I do have wide, but so we're going to, there we go. I also changed the focus area color to red just because I like it. And I think that is all we need. Oh, here's one little thing. Uh, you can circulate your autofocus point. So if you go to the edge, if you hit up against the edge, it will pop up on the other side. I haven't really needed to. Uh, the responsiveness on the autofocus point with the Sony cameras is really good. So I haven't needed to, but that's where you can set that. Subject rec recognition. Generally speaking, I leave this off. Um, I want to be able to jump into it pretty quickly. So I have it in my function menu but I leave this off. And the reason why is that Sony cameras find faces all over the place. It finds it in rocks and trees and clouds. I don't have this problem nearly as much with the other camera companies, but it's just very aggressive about like, oh, there's an eye, oh, there's an eye. So if your little spot, you're focusing on something particular and then it's, it's not too far from a rock that it thinks is a face or a cloud or whatever. So I turn this off, but of course I do shoot people sometimes. I do have people in the context of the landscape photography or like I said, thumbnails and stuff like that. So I wanna be able to get to the setting, but generally speaking, I leave it off. So that's, that's really all we're doing there. Uh, focus, assist, focus assistant. Uh, this is uh, auto magnification in manual focus. You definitely want that. And you can turn on focus magnifier. You can jump into focus magnifier here if we were in AFS. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. Peaking display. The default settings here are great, except for 
I like red. But mid's great. And then on, of course. Okay. So the next couple of, of menus, we don't really need to get into. I, yeah, we don't really need to get into those. That's the network and the playback menus. There's nothing in particular that is relevant to what we're working on today. All right, so now we're in the setup menu, the bottom one, which is where we're gonna be doing most of our customization. So operation customize, dial customize, we're gonna be using both of these, touch operation. So let's just go straight into operation customize. And right at the top here is our custom button setup. So here's where it, things start getting super subjective. And I'm basically sharing how I have it set up. If this doesn't make sense to you, it's gonna be pretty obvious how you could do some other really cool stuff. So with all that being said, we're just gonna jump into uh, right off the top. So. It's, it's, it's forcing me to really explain here. So number one, uh, the AEL button. So, uh, which is over here on the far right side of the camera. I have recall custom hold two, which is focus area wide. That's, and AF on. So this is my autofocus bailout button. So essentially what I have the AEL set up to do is if I essentially am not with this with the small with the sub small with the small spot if I'm not being able to get focus then or I'm quickly moving through a panorama honestly this is mainly for when I'm shooting handheld panoramas uh, sometimes as I'm moving through a panorama my spot wanders off and I'm needing to take the shots fairly quickly, the light's changing or something of that nature. This is my autofocus bailout button. I press that button, it goes into wide autofocus, so it's gonna focus on what it thinks the subject is, which is 80% of the time correct, enough percent of the time correct that it works fairly well. And then it also turns on, it acts as an AF on button, so I can just continue to shoot. So it basically gives me a way to instantaneously switch between the two uh, autofocus areas that I selected. So we're going to go back. So uh, number two is AF on, is AF on. Uh, number three is recall custom hold one. This one is a little more complicated. This is my patent pending exposure bailout button. So essentially what this allows me to do is that if I've if the light changes or something happens and I've wandered into a bad place exposure wise and I need to immediately have the camera start making exposure decisions for me, then I press this button, press and hold this button. So how I have it set out is I have turned on shoot mode, which is aperture priority, right? And then I also have it set to ISO auto. That's because basically, I don't want it to shoot immediately jump to a, a uh, shutter speed that's super slow. So if I'm in uh, ISO 100, the exposure changes, but I'm shooting handheld, then I don't want it to meet like at half a second, I'm not gonna be able to shoot that, right? So I do have it set to ISO auto because this is a bailout thing, right? This is something that where I need to get the shot quickly. So you can choose, you can decide if you do most of your shooting from a tripod, then uh, if you do most of your shooting from a tripod, then turn this off, right? And then just have it be aperture priority and that works. And then I also have it do AF on. So essentially I have my autofocus bailout, my uh, exposure bailout button. Number four is my dial during hold. So this is just a way to quickly change my dial one. So I'm gonna jump into my dial setting. So I have the front dial do white balance. I have the rear dial do exposure compensation. If I'm set into custom Kelvin mode, then the secondary real dial, which is this one, will change the Kelvin. And then the control wheel is a redundant exposure compensation. 
this is just a way, a quick way for me to change white balance. This is basically how I've decided I change white balance. So really the main thing I do is I hold down C3 and I control the front dial to change my white balance setting. And then I can also quickly change the Kelvin if I want to do a custom Kelvin. So if I hope that makes sense. And then uh, in the off chance I am in a mode like aperture priority or shutter priority, I can also use this button to change the exposure compensation. So again, you're probably seeing just how crazy customizable this camera is because like this is my dial one during hold. You could do my dial two, my dial three, my dial one, two, or three. You can toggle them. Like it's just, it's really impressive how customizable this camera is. It's almost too much. It's almost too customizable. You could get so lost in the weeds. Um, number five, focus magnifier. Okay, so we're at the place where I talked about that. So we are where, uh, this is where you would want to be in AFS mode. Uh, basically what this does is that this zooms in uh, live and allows you to autofocus really super precisely. I don't use it all that often, but when I do, when I really want to know that I'm getting critical focus on something that's hard to focus on, really most of the time you would use this if you had like a foreground element like a flower or a plant or a tree that you really want to make sure you have focus on that and you don't trust the little point to have really gotten it critically, then I would put the camera in AFS and then use this button to zoom in and get that critical focus. And you can autofocus with it. So um, you can manual focus or autofocus. So it's really handy that way. So that's how I have that set up. These buttons on rear two, I have all at their defaults. Um, I don't really need to change them. Uh, this, the, if you click into the joystick button, it does some context Focus standard means it has some context sensitive things that it can do, but generally speaking, all it does is bumps it right into the middle. Um, drive mode, uh, that's a great place for it. The uh, left side of the dial. ISO on the right side of the dial. I, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I do ISO with one of the dials, which we're gonna talk about in a second. So I leave that there. Um, you're welcome to explore things that you can set these to, but I just never have needed to. All right, top of the camera. So focus mode is number one. So this is <laughs> when I need to switch to AFS, this is the button that I press to change it to AFS. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, and then switch it back to AFC as soon as I can. Uh, switch autofocus area. So this, instead of having it just open up a menu where you select the autofocus area, all this does is a button that you click through and it will change the autofocus areas quickly because I only have two selected. That means I'm going between single point, small and wide just by clicking that button. Is it redundant when I have this button here? Yes, but there are times when I might wanna stay in wide for a longer period of time. So I have that set there like that. Um, lens, focus hold, that works great. And then here's where we change our dials. So I learned how to shoot on Canon. So I'm super quirky in that I like the front dial to be uh, shutter speed and the rear dial to be aperture. So that's how I have it set in manual mode. So in manual mode, this is shutter speed. And then the rear dial is aperture. And then I have the third dial be ISO. And this is one of the things I love about this camera is this customizable third dial that you can lock. So essentially I can change ISO on the fly if I want to, but I can also lock it. I'm not gonna bump it. Um, it's just, it gives me some versatility because I don't have to press a button if I don't want to. If I'm changing it a lot, I can leave this dial unlocked. But if I'm shooting most of the time at ISO 100, which I am, I can lock it and I'm gonna stay at ISO 100. It's not gonna change on me. So I really like that setup. So that's how I have my custom button set up. 
And as you can see, I don't even have every button customized. There's so much you can do with this camera. And it's kind of an evolving, th that's the thing with these Sony cameras is that it's always an evolving thing. You kind of, you get in the field and you're like, oh, what if I did this? What if I did this? So it changes all the time. But I've been using this setup for a little while now on this camera. It's worked extremely well for landscape photography. I think you can kind of see how it's very landscape photography specific. So, okay, function menu settings. Um, the main ones that I change here that I want access to is on the uh, on the upper left. This is where I can quickly change, turn on subject rec recognition on and off. So if I want it to recognize a person, I'll turn it on. And then you can change your target here. If there was an animal that you wanted to change it to, you can do that. Um, creative looks, I also want to make sure that that's in the function menu. So this is where I would go into black and white mode. Um, I really wish that uh, the camera companies would let you filter out the custom looks that you want to use and don't want to use because the black and white's buried pretty deep in there and I would prefer to just, you know, switch between standard and black and white if at all possible. Um, white balance is also here. Touch operation, I turn that on and off here. I also have it set to where the grid line display, I can turn that on and off here. So those are the settings that I need to jump to quickly um, in the function menu. So that's kind of how I've set it up. I've never been a huge function menu shooter, a user, excuse me. Um, I, I, you know, I know a lot of people, they kind of have that, they, all their settings are kind of there and they're very like set up. And I just kind of put the settings that I need there in there and then the other ones just kind of live. Like I probably, like if I'm being honest, I could almost certainly find a more useful um, if I'm being honest, I can almost certainly find a more useful thing for some of these, but I just haven't, I change things kind of sometimes as they come up. So that's something that would, I think would evolve for you. Um, different set for stills and movie. This is not a specific thing for landscape photography, but I still strongly recommend that you do change this so that when, if you are shooting stills and movie at the same time, that you kind of customize that. All right, display screen set, monitor. Only thing that I change here is, is that I don't have for viewfinder. I find that that's not particularly useful. Um, I also, change this to where it says exposure on and exposure timeout. I, it's really important to me. <clears throat> it's really important to me that I'm able to get a completely clear screen. So when I change this to exposure timeout, uh, basically after I change the setting in a couple of seconds, it will go completely clear and I can see the image by itself. That's important to me. So I change that. And then sometimes I turn off display all info. It's just, it's so cluttered sometimes to have all that, but it's also useful. So that's kind of a give and take. Um, viewfinder is very similar, except that I do turn off display all info in the viewfinder all the time, because I just don't need that stuff in the viewfinder. I can look at the back screen if I really need to find that stuff out. And this is a, this is a thing that like on Canon and Sony and Fuji and Leica and a lot of these other companies that have big top screens is that you can reference settings on that. Sony doesn't have it. You're completely dependent dependent on the rear screen for that. So, you know, it's a give and take thing. Um, okay, dial customize. We all really, already really covered that, but this is a, another way to go in there. Touch operation. Let's, we, I have, um, Touch operation on, touch uh, sensitivity on, and then touch panel only, instead of where you can touch the back screen to move the autofocus point around. So touch panel settings, swipe up. I don't have any of that set up, so. All right. Um, all of this stuff is pretty much default, except that I change, here it is. 
display quality to high in the viewfinder, I really, it's so gorgeous. I know it burns more battery, but it's not that much more. And it's so gorgeous to look at your images through this huge, almost 10 million dot viewfinder, high quality. It's, it's a wonderful experience. Go ahead and turn that on. I feel like it's worth it. So, um, and the finder frame rate, you can turn it to high if you want. That I leave on standard. I feel like that works great. And that is everything except for there's a important setting all the way down. So really, it's kind of funny. In some ways, this should be the first setting that you change when you get your new camera. Um, but Sony has it all the way down, the very last setting in the last menu, and that is anti-dust function. What that does is it will close the shutter when you power off the camera. You want that on so that when you're swapping lenses, it protects the shutter from getting dust on it. Um, it's, it is the shutter. It is the shutter. So do take care that there's not direct sunlight on it when you take a lens off and never ever touch it. It's one of the most delicate things in the camera, but it is also really nice to not have to clean the sensor all the time. And Sony cameras are notorious for getting very dirty sensors. So I'm really glad this feature is here. Please turn it on, but also make sure to be careful. Okay, here we are. We have set up our A7R5 for landscape photography. Um, there's so much more going on with this camera. As you could see, all of the settings that I skipped over. So I would definitely recommend finding a video that has more, uh, uh, covers all of these different settings. Uh, I know uh, Mark Gaylor, he's got videos that cover a lot of that stuff. So I definitely would, you could check out his stuff. But this is how I have this camera set up for landscape photography. And I hope that this is helpful with you getting your camera to a place where you're confident and comfortable uh, basically getting those landscape shots. So now we are going to talk about accessories. So we talked about the, this is kind of internal customization. And now we're going to talk about all of the stuff that will externally help you get amazing landscape shots. So we'll jump to that now. Okay. So let's talk about accessories or stuff that you need in addition to cameras and lenses. So um, the best way to, the best place to start, I think, is going to be the pack I'm using. Now I have a lot of different camera bags. Um, this is maybe my most used right now. So, and it's definitely been featured prominently in this video. And this is the Shimoda Action X 25. Um, it's the version two of the Action X. So it's a pretty new release. And I really like, I think uh, 25 liters is great for kind of in the mountain shooting, uh, bare minimum. So yeah, I really enjoy this pack. I also have a Shimoda um, Explore 35 back at home that I would say that's my landscape photography base bag, like that I normally keep all of this stuff in and kind of use on a, on a, you know, when I'm shooting out of the car, short hikes and stuff, but long, big days in the mountains, Action X 25. Um, attached to that, I have a Peak Design capture clip so you can slide the camera in there and have it on externally. It's an indispensable piece of photography gear. And then on the other side, I have the tripod that I've used on this trip and many trips. This is the Leo Photo LS255 CEX Ranger. Um, and I have wrapped it in bicycle tape to make it uh, more comfortable in cold weather shooting. It gets pretty tall. Um, normally, I like using just these top three um, just for stability, but you can knock it out to that lowest. Let me. Get it out. Obviously, you've been seeing me using this tripod a lot. So you can see it gets fairly tall. On the top, I have the Acrotec long lens uh, tripod head. This is my favorite head. It's great for panoramas. It has a huge spirit level right there. 
and uh, I just have really gotten to where I enjoy this more than a ball head. Um, however, to really get the most out of this head, you have to have a leveling base on the tripod, either built in like it is on this Leo photo or externally attached because there's no way to level the uh, tripod head if you don't have a ball or some way to level it. So this is my backpacking lightweight go in the mountains tripod and I love it. It's the perfect weight to be a fully functional tripod but still not weighing me down where I feel like, oh, I wish I didn't have this thing. I, I don't really think about it. Okay, a couple of other accessories. This is the Sony RMT P1BT Commander. Uh, <laughs> that is a long name for just a Bluetooth remote. Sony killed it with their Bluetooth remotes. It, uh, this is, it's the most functional of any of them. Uh, <laughs> And the, they're the only one that really make one like this. I mean, Canon has one, but it's really cumbersome to use. Nikon's is super expensive and you have to plug it in and all this stuff. This is just a Bluetooth remote. You pair it to the camera one time, you turn on the remote or you unlock the remote and the camera just, the shutter works. It has an AF on button. It does whatever the C1 on the camera does and if you have a power zoom lens, you can zoom in and out there. So that's super handy. And all the way around, one of the most useful accessories that Sony makes. And I have it attached to this lanyard. So while I'm shooting, I just toss this over my neck and I have a new strap that I have been using. This is actually a Leica strap that I've, uh, they're actually fairly hard to get, but I have kind of wanted this climbing rope Leica strap that's red with the leather stuff. I mean, it's, it's you know, kind of an indulgent thing, but I enjoy it. And then I attached the Peak Design toggles to the end so that I can use the little lugs. I think I'll uh, show you. I have one attached to the camera right now, but yeah, it goes in like that. So, Peak Design lug. So yeah, this is a, uh, and these climbing rope straps, you don't have to get a Leica. Lots of companies make these, but I've been enjoying them. I, I also have the Peak Design slide light and the Peak Design, I think they call it a sling or a leash. Um, I use both of those and like both of those, but the, the climbing rope straps I've been kind of enjoying lately. So that is that. Now, um, I'll show you this thing. So I do have a traditional L bracket for the A7R5, but I picked up this thing from Small Rig and I've really only gotten to use it on this trip. But my first impressions are that while the camera's on the tripod, it's the best tripod shooting experience I've ever had. Being able to change it quickly, there's a lot of resistance here, so you don't have to tighten it every time. You can quickly change from portrait to landscape. Um, like I said, I've been using it in this guide a lot and really enjoying it. It's extremely well made. It has a little thing. You have to take uh, the lens off to attach it. So that's a little bit of a bummer. And this part sticks out. So for handheld shooting, it's just okay. But I feel like the trade-offs are worth it, at least right now. Um, I'll maybe do a long-term review on this thing at some point, but right now, I'm loving it. Right now, they only make it for the A7R5, so that's pretty cool, and that's pretty great because the A7R5 has some trouble with traditional L brackets because it has the flip screen, so it kind of solves that problem. You can put an L bracket on it, but you do have to be careful with it. So, that is... Uh, my L bracket solution right now. So I promised to talk about memory cards or data. So I do not use the CF Express Type A. I don't feel like they're necessary for landscape photography. It's not a cost effective way to store your photos. So I use ProGrade Cobalt memory cards. I have not had trouble with ProGrade SD cards for any of my work. I've been using them for 
a long time and these cobalts are very fast. So I really like them. So my memory card workflow, how I use them. So I have in my little, this is a uh, Shimoda, um, let me see. It's a Shimoda little accessory pouch they make. So in here, I keep a spare battery. I keep um, a little tool for a hex tool thing and a spare Peak Design plate for attaching for the thing. I always keep a spare one of those in here. So that's this pouch. Wherever the camera is, this pouch is. So this is my memory card holder. It's a Shimoda. It's kind of a soft pouch, but it's got three sections here. And so my workflow is that the top memory card, this is my working memory card. So this is the card I take out. I import the images into the computer and then I put it back in and I reformat it. I do not reformat the other one. So I use both card slots to back up, as you saw in the menu section. I do not reformat the other one. When I do the other one, when it fills up, what I do is I take it out and I put it in this case, in this slot, the second slot here. And I know that this here is basically a backup's backup. So I have the images on a memory card in this case for, you know, however long it takes me to get back around to this memory card. So it's just an added redundancy thing for a bailout for like, okay, these images exist somewhere if something happens. Now, of course I have a backup workflow and all that stuff. So it really is a super redundant thing, but then I would take, so eventually I would use these memory cards. I would take this one out. I would put it in and then reformat it. So that's my workflow to kind of keep, um, to keep on top of having image backups. And then I will reformat the top memory card as soon as I put it back in the camera. So it's kind of a working, that's kind of my rotation. I also have, as you can see, I've written in Sharpie, import do not use. This section is for memory cards from the slot one that I take out and put in here if I'm on a trip and I fill up both memory card slots. So the memory card from the slot one goes into import do not use. So I will never ever take a memory card out of this import do not use um, without making sure that it is, I am clear to do so. Like, yeah, I just would never have a memory card in here. There is a memory card in here because we've been on a trip and there's data on there. So I would never ever take one of these out without putting it in a computer first. So I have lots of memory cards to kind of work with. Not all of them are the uh, ProGrade Cobalt. I like using the ProGrade Cobalt as much as I can, but not all of them are. So yeah, that is my memory card workflow. So it just is a added redundancy, redundancy thing. I, you may not need that. I've only ever, <laughs> I've, I have actually gone digging on memory cards to get photos before. So, and ever since I did that, I've been pretty strict about making sure that they live somewhere on a backup location until they're on Normally I have it backed up to the cloud. So last thing I have to talk about, because I am a landscape photographer, the all important filters. So I am not a big filter guy. A lot of landscape photographers, they love their filters and I don't think that's a bad way to work. You are certainly allowed to have filters. I feel like they degrade image quality, they change color. There's lots of things about filters. So I use filters if I have to and I keep them in here. So basically my filters all need to do double duty because I shoot a lot of video too. So these are the Peter McKinnon Polar Pro um, variable neutral density filters. 
Uh, neutral density is the filter I use 95% of the time. I have polarizing filter as well. I hardly ever use that. I just feel like it just causes drama in the final image. There's certain times where I wanna get rid of reflections that I can use it, but generally speaking, I use the uh, Peter McKinnon Polar Pro. I have a two to five stop. I have a six to 10 stop. And then I have a two to five stop in a 67 mil filter thread. So that's mainly for video applications. I have some cameras with uh, video lenses. Excuse me. I when I'm shooting video, I have it with 67 millimeter thread. But I these are both 82. And then down here, I have a whole mess of step up rings for various lens sizes. Um, this one is 67 to 82. This one is 77 to 82, and then I have a 72 to 82. So that's so I can put those filters on any camera. I don't haul these into the field all that often. If I do, I'll bring one of them, and usually it's to shoot video. So not a huge filter guy. Um, if, you, if you are interested in filter, uh, a brand to look into is Case Filters. I've heard really good things about them. Um, for their landscape filters. And there's a whole magnetic system that they use that seems really cool. So if you're into filters or you're interested in doing filter landscape photography, I think that's a great, um, that's a great place to start. Um, but like I said, I mainly use them for video and every once in a while, I use it to slow my shutter speed down for, to blur out water or to blur out clouds, something of that nature. So hopefully in this video, I have a chance to do that. Uh, but it's really not all that often. So that does it for the menu walkthrough and the accessories. Um, let's get back into the field. All right, all right, we have had a epic hike in the dark up to above Lower Blue Lake. So this is the first of three of the Blue Lakes in the San Juan Mountains. And so we are on this little overlook off the side of the trail and we're looking at Dallas Peak right there. So uh, sunrise is kind of happening right now. So we're gonna shoot for a little while here um, because uh, the, the sun is gonna come up and fill the basin. So right now, although honestly, we are getting a remarkable blue color. So my composition right now, I do have a little bit of this rock in the foreground. Um, that's just a little bit of texture, I think in post. I think I'm gonna probably darken that. It just gives it ground. Um, I'm at 20 millimeters. I'm all the way out on this 20 to 70. Um, I'm focusing on the other side of the, the basin here. Um, that should have pretty much everything I want in sharp, sharp. This rock in the foreground is maybe not. Let's actually take a look and see how sharp it is or isn't. And yeah, it's not that sharp but it's sharp enough that as a little foreground anchoring element, it's not making that big of a difference. So one of the things though, that I'm gonna, I'm gonna check here. So I stopped down to F10. Uh, something that I'm gonna check because on these higher megapixel Sony's, or on any higher megapixel camera, but something that's 61 megapixel, you are going to be dealing with diffraction sooner. So um, it just shows up sooner. So let's take a look here and make sure that I'm not getting any diffraction and I am getting a little bit of diffraction at F10. So on this, on this lens. So I'm gonna stop back down to F8, see how I feel about that. So it's gonna be a little overexposed because I didn't compensate my shutter. Let's try that. Look at that. Yeah, now we're back to 
not it's not diffracted so that is something that you do have to keep in mind for uh, for these high megapixel cameras is that you you'll need to focus stack and the exposure is changing extremely rapidly i'm actually going to try some different compositions i kind of like what the light's doing up there just just to experiment i'm not saying this is the shot so that's something that i'm a big fan of is i definitely like working a scene i I know a lot of landscape photographers, they really like finding, I'm switching into a panorama now. Uh, they like finding a composition and then kind of shooting it as the light changes. Um, and that's not a bad way to work. I think that's a great way to work. I like shooting more where I'm constantly kind of changing things up and, and finding the best composition for the light because Right now, the most interesting thing that's happening is the way that the sun is hitting the band on Dallas. So, so similar to last night shooting, I am a full stop underexposed right now. There are brights are bright enough that the 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 overall meter is is saying that yeah, like oh, you're a little underexposed because it's saying that more than not in the frame is underexposed, but what is over what could be overexposed or what is correctly exposed is would go way, would clip. So well, we lost our light for a minute, although we are having cool things happening over there. There's not really a... I have to go back up yeah, to the trail. Let's actually go back up to the trail. I'm going to leave the tripod here. Go in handheld, go in rogue because it's doing cool stuff up there. So. We're gonna grab the shot, and it's also fun to do handheld shooting. So let's go up there. Probably this way. We're dealing with a little bit of exposure here. <laughs> it is a little exposed. So, here. this is where the 20 to 70 is coming in super clutch. I didn't have to swap lenses. I was shooting a relatively wide shot. Now I'm taking a lot of frames right now because I'm shooting handheld. Um, it just it gives me an opportunity to, sh uh, to get something sharp. And also the clouds are changing literally that fast. I don't know if Toby can show how hard they are blowing on this peak. Let's see if we're getting sharp. So I'm shooting at 1 1 of a second, which is pretty slow. Now I'm at 1.30th, I'm going to 1.30th. And just like that, our light is kind of gone. But that was a cool, cool little lighting event. All right, well, I think let's head back, make some coffee, and wait for the basin to fill with more light. This is gorgeous.
So, this is one of the situations where I uh, use a filter. I'm not a big filter user, but this is a situation. And what I'm wanting to do is blur out the lake here. So we're at the upper Blue Lake, uh, 12,000 feet. And the wind is crazy, as you can hear. And it's making the waves a lot of movement on the lake. So it's an opportunity to kind of blur it out and do something very visually interesting. So right now I have the ND filter on. I'm at F8 and I have four stops of neutral density on right now. So let's see what this does. This is at a quarter second. Uh, I like it. That's very cool. I maybe want a little slower. So let's open it up to, let's try a half second. And it says I'm not clipping, but I'm gonna stop down to F9. It says I'm not clipping. Yeah, a half second was cooler. Pixel Shift high res shooting was introduced on, I believe, the Sony A7R4. However, it was largely useless because for landscape photography because any motion in the scene would cause this weird smearing effect. Um, with the A7R5, Sony has introduced, at least on the software side, the ability to do some motion compensation. So, we're down at the lower blue lake, uh, down at the lake we were shooting up above. We were up on that rock up there uh, this morning. Uh, and I'm just gonna take basically a test shot. Like, I mean, it's it's a, it's a cool shot, um, but it's not, the, the lighting is kind of, you know, it's, it's getting midday now. So, um, I have the 16 shot um, pixel shift mode. So now it's shooting, it uses the electronic shutter and there we go. So now it's writing them to the card. And honestly, like I can't check it now. So we're gonna have to see uh, in post how the shot turned out. I'm gonna take another one just to make sure. Uh, one important thing about the pixel shift mode is that it is in the drive mode, but only in the drive mode in the menu. If you press the button on it to do the drive mode on there, um, it's not there. So if you want quick access to it, I believe, let me actually make check that real quick. You can. And there, I just added it to the function menu. So that's maybe the quickest way to do it. Okay, welcome to my office. We are going to now jump into like one of the funnest parts of the landscape photography process. And that is bringing our files home looking at them on the computer and editing them. So here's how this section is going to work. We are going to look at um, a bunch of the photos from the shoot down in the San Juans. A uh, lot of these you'll recognize from in the field, the raw files in the field. So we're going to look at the raw photo and then we're going to look at my edit of the photo for a bunch of the photos. And then we're going to take one photo and I'm gonna go ahead and do a deep dive edit on it so you can see my whole editing process. So um, we're gonna do that. I'm also going to show you how to merge a pixel shift image in the Imaging Edge software. So that's gonna be the last thing we do. Um, I just think it's valuable to see how to do that. And then we'll look at it in Lightroom and, and see how, uh, see what those, that over 200 megapixel uh, image looks like. So let's go ahead and jump into Lightroom here. So I have gone through, I have sorted and done some rating and some work on some of these photos. So we're going to just get right here. So this is a raw photo from early in the evening. And uh, yeah, I was, you know, happy with the clouds, but um, 
you can see how it was important that we retain the data in those clouds. You can see how brilliantly sharp and how high quality the A7R uh, five files are. And here is the edit of it. Um, definitely brought down the highlights, did a little toning. Um, I like it quite a bit. So these photos, part of what I want to show you with this process of looking at these photos is that like, not all of these photos are ready for your portfolio. It's extracting the most that you can from the files that you get. This isn't the best photo I've ever taken from this location. Um, I don't know that any of these are, but it's kind of extracting the best and I had fun with the edit and that's kind of what all of these are about. So I'm not like showing these as like my favorite photos I've ever taken, but they are the photos that I took um, on this adventure with the A7R5 and I really want to show you what I was able to get. So uh, let's go on to the next one. This is the panorama, one of the panoramas that I took, but um, this is my favorite of the uh, panoramas in the evening. And here is the edit. So as you can see, I cropped it a little bit. Um, I toned it a little different. It was also the sunset, as the sunset progressed, it gets redder, uh, more magenta tones, and you can definitely uh, see that here. And even more so in this next one, so here's the raw photo. And this one is my favorite from the evening, hands down, as you can see. Here's the finished edit. I really liked how this turned out. Maybe it's a little uh, saturated, actually. Honestly, I'm gonna jump in the develop module and turn down the saturation just ever so slightly. Yeah, I like that. Um, but this is probably my favorite from the evening. I liked the spotlight on this west face of Sneffels, the way the clouds were configured. I just, you know, I, I really like this photo. So those are the shots from the evening. And again, the raw file, um, I definitely, you can see why I exposed for the clouds. No problem bringing the detail up here but getting the detail back from the clouds would have been hard. And all of these tones that you can see throughout the clouds, just very hard to get back if you overexpose. So definitely ex underexpose a little bit in situations in super high dynamic range situations. And I think these photos more so than the photos the next morning really show the dynamic range of the A7R5. Just like every shot you can see how much data you're able to pull from this sensor. It really is one of the best sensors I have worked with. Um, and now that like it's really gunning with the great autofocus and a lot of the features of the A7R5, just love it. All right, so now let's go to the photos from the next morning. Here is actually the very first shot I took the next morning. Now here I was doing the opposite. I was wanting to get a lot of data in the shadows, this is an overexposed image, but I could tell by reading my histogram, I was still getting all the data in the sky. And then here is the edit, very dramatic difference. Um, you can see I brought out the the color in this lake, which is just phenomenal. The, the blue lakes are something to behold. Like this may look like it's fake to you, but standing at that location, this really, is kind of what it feels like. You're looking at this like magical blue lagoon, magical blue lagoon that is probably was near freezing or below free is very cold. Um, wouldn't want to swim in it, but so yeah. So here's several more. Here's one of the panoramas I took. Um, and then here's the edit, very similar edit, right? Because it's from the same location. The colors were the same. I do. I, I can't decide which composition I like better. Um, do I like this one or the, the, the panorama, the panorama, it picks up something cool. And this in the middle is, uh, Dallas peak and uh, an interesting, like, I don't know if it's a trivia thing, but or whatever, this is Dallas peak. This, this peak right here, this summit is considered by most people who know what they're doing to be the hardest mountain in Colorado to climb and the most dangerous mountain in Colorado to climb. So that's Dallas peak. Um, <laughs> it's kind of funny. 
All right, so here is one of the images that I took of this other peak. I'm not even sure what it's called. Uh, close to, as you'll remember, we went on the little um, side uh, handheld up on the trail. And here's the final edit. Honestly, didn't do a whole lot here. This was a great shot. I loved the color. Um, I just, you know, basically pumped up the saturation, the contrast. Um, again, a high dynamic range scene, but was able to to retain it. I love in images like this. I love like bringing out details like this little snowfield here that has held out throughout the summer. Um, that's just you know that's fun, and you can see the awesome image quality um, and sharpness of the twenty to seventy combined with the A seven R five. Really, I cannot. That lens kind of feels like a miracle lens a little bit. How sharp it is for how small it is and how versatile it is. Really incredible. Um, of course, we went back, got some coffee. I shot some more shots from that location. So there's an edit. Um, went a little subtler on the edit. I wanted to, on this one, these clouds were creating this light box effect up here with, with Dallas um, Peak right there. And I just kind of wanted to de-emphasize a little bit the foreground. I felt like it was just a little bit more moody. You know, even though it's similar situations, I, I enjoy um, getting different, you know, trying to get, extract different tones and experimenting. Um, this one here, this is the one that we are going to edit in a couple minutes. Um, I felt like this one had a lot of dynamic range and I feel like would be a interesting photo to do the edit on. So the last one here that I did want to show you was the one that I took with the filter. And honestly, I'm kind of disappointed with how it turned out. Um, it's underexposed. It's the, uh, the composition's just okay. The, the, it wound up having a lot of dead space. Um, so, but here is the final edit here. Obviously I cropped in, I did a lot of work, but you can see I should have had a longer shutter speed. I needed to, uh, basically stop it down. I mean, um, yeah, open, uh, yeah, have a longer shutter speed than I had because it's still, it's just too busy. It didn't smooth out quite like what I was wanting. Um, yeah. And it just, the whole composition, if I had it to do over, I would have gotten a little lower. So I would have decreased the distance from these to the other shore. So it just would have had more interesting elements and not quite this dead space here. I like the, the, the light hitting right here. It would have been amazing if the light was hitting all the way across right there. Then this shot would have been amazing. Um, but as it, it stands, it's just okay. Once again, I really wanted to show you guys that like a huge part of this process is taking images that you're just okay with. It's still important to go ahead and edit them out and get a feel for them and see what you can get out of them. I can't tell you how many times I've thought I've taken a mediocre image in the field, then brought it home and it was amazing. And then it's also, it seems like it's always vice versa where I think I get an amazing image in the field, bring it home and I'm disappointed. So you have both experiences, but this is kind of a good example of that. So let's go ahead and do our edit for this image. So. I use three programs to edit primarily um, with Sony files, the Lightroom that we're in right now. And then I also use Photoshop some for touch up work and certain applications. And then I also love Luminar Neo. Luminar Neo really does some fantastic color work and makes images pop. And I kind of love what they're doing with that program. I would highly recommend it. Um, so we're going to be using all three of those prog uh, programs in editing this image. So the first thing, let's go ahead and make it as big as we can get rid of that. So the first thing is, is that we have a big imbalance between the foreground and the sky. So let's go ahead and just drop the highlights down. You can see we have retained a ton of information in those clouds. You look at the histogram, we're not even close to clipping. So. That's incredible. So let's go ahead and bring up the shadows a little bit. I'm actually gonna increase the overall exposure of the image a little bit. And all the time kind of watching my highlights over here. If I do get into a situation where I need to bring up the exposure enough 
that it does start getting a little clippy. Um, it's not clipping here, but it's thinking about it. Um, I will just select the sky here, super handy, and then just bring down the highlights even more in the sky. And then that's, that's uh, a nicely balanced image. So the next thing I'm gonna do is with the curves, just gonna add some contrast with kind of a standard S curve. Um, and again, it seems like I just dropped my exposure. I mean, I brought up my exposure to drop it again. That's kind of part of the process is as I'm adding contrast, is this like, okay, where, where do I bring up exposure to add contrast? Because contrast is really a huge part of what makes, gives, um, images that dynamic feel. So, um, whoops. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to bring it down even a little bit, even more. Um, and I also am prepping this uh, file to go into Luminar Neo. I kind of know what I'm going to do in Luminar Neo to kind of maximize. So is it a little overexposed here? The histogram doesn't say so, but my eye feels like it's a little, so I'm going to jump back into that sky mask and bring it down even a little bit more. So. This is a file I feel like is getting ready for Luminar, is about ready for Luminar Neo. So there's two ways that I jump into Luminar Neo from Lightroom. The first way is just to right click on, click edit in and Luminar Neo. Now I'm gonna do a couple of things to this image in Photoshop. So I'm actually just going to take it straight into Photoshop and then use Luminar Neo as a filter in Photoshop. So. Let's go ahead and do that. Click edit in Adobe Photoshop. And it's gonna open it up. Here we are. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to duplicate this layer. So that's super important. Uh, anytime you're working in Photoshop, you want the background layer to be what you brought into Photoshop. And then you make edits on layers above it until you're done with the image and then you can flatten it. Um, but I don't want to edit the background layer. I want to be able to get back to how I brought it into Photoshop in case I just get completely carried away here, which is entirely possible. So filter, Skyloom software, and Luminar Neo. It's gonna open it up. All right, here we are in Luminar Neo. We just need to click the little edit button here. This first part is kind of a preset screen. And the first thing we're going to do is the very top thing, and that's enhance AI. There's accent AI and sky enhancer. This is like a little, it's easy to get carried away with it, but I like that it kind of naturally brings up exposure while maintaining a contrasty look. You'll kind of see what I mean as I add a little bit of it. You can see it just, I still have that contrasty look, but I have a little bit more exposure in my shadows here. And then the sky enhancer, we'll just darken the sky just a little bit. We're gonna, uh, you know, restraint is key in Luminar because it's easy to get carried away. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump down here to this landscape pane and see how it says golden hour here. This image was, believe it or not, taken in golden hour. So, I'm going to go ahead and give it a little kick of golden hour. It, as you can see, it kind of brought in some saturations in these warm tones. The whole image is starting to feel a little cool to me. I'm gonna jump up to develop, go to color, and I'm just gonna warm the whole thing up. That's gonna start feeling more like it felt. Now, I don't wanna go too far. I don't wanna lose the blue tones, particularly in the water, but just, it was a cool feeling morning. And then, but it does make my highlights here up on the mountains feel a little more gold. Um, I'm also gonna up the exposure a little bit. Just overall, just a little, just a little. Okay, so this is, this top part is called Essentials. And that's pretty much all we need to do in essentials. Um, we could jump down here to professional, <laughs> uh, super contrast. Let's just see what super contrast does. 
Um, you can kind of mess with, with the balance of the highlights. I kind of like, I, I don't really like any of either of those. Let's see with the midtones. Um, I kind of like that. I feel like that helps with contrast and shadows. Just drag that along a little bit and then, yeah. So let's look at before and after the super contrast. Definitely a little improvement for sure. Um, the last thing we're going to do in Luminar is a little trick, a little, um, it's called mood here and essentially it's a LUT. So it has some preloaded LUTs. You can actually do your own. Uh, but I like these cinematic toning ones. They're overkill most of the time. Like they're too strong, but you can back them off. So I like going through here. I like that one. Long Beach looks cool. Um, Riverside, almost cool, but not quite. San Diego. And then there's Santa Barbara. I think it was between Santa Barbara and Long Beach. Let's look at Long Beach. Let's look at Santa Barbara. I think... I think I like Long Beach a little bit more, but I am going to back it off. And I feel like I need to up the exposure. So another handy important thing is that once you've used a tool, the tool jumps over here into the edits pane. Essentially, this is like a history slash, I don't know, way to finish the image. It's kind of annoying. I go here and then I'm going to up the exposure again. So this is, let's take a look at what it looked like when we brought it into Luminar. Looked like that. So not a bad image. Definitely Luminar added quite a bit, but I really want this lake to feel like a centerpiece of this image. So that's why we brought it into Photoshop. Let's go ahead and apply this. Okay. So now I've got to decide if I want to keep this down here and I think I don't. So let's go ahead and eliminate it. I'm just going to get the lasso tool, draw a rough thing around it and contact to wear fill. Yep. Cool. I think that was, that was a good choice. I think, I think it was a little distracting. That's, that's much better. Okay. So let's make that lake sing. Um, I'm going to duplicate the layer that we just did with Luminar Neo. And I'm actually going to, you know what, because this is a tutorial, I'm going to rename this layer Neo. And then I'm going to duplicate it and name this one lake. All right. So let's take the lake layer and open it up in camera raw filter. All right. So basically camera raw is like a, a light room that's built into Photoshop. So what we're going to do is I'm going to up the exposure on the lake. I'm only doing this for the lake. So ignore the whole top part of the image. We're going to up the exposure a little bit. Mess with contrast a little bit. Just add a little pop. Dare I add a little vibrance? Uh, yes, I dare. I dare. So I think as long as I'm not overexposing anything, which I'm not, uh, I think that's actually kind of what I was looking for. And again, this is just for the lake. I'm going to click OK. So now I'm going to hold down the Option key. Uh, or the alt key on windows. I think I haven't used windows in uh, quite a few years. So, and then click the mask button and that's going to put a filled in mask on that new layer. And I'm going to select the brush tool and I'm going to reduce the flow down to like 10%. Let's do 11%. Okay. Do a fairly big brush and then take your hardness all the way down to zero. So, and what we're going to do is we're just going to start painting in that obnoxiously bright and saturated, but you can see how we're creating, giving the lake more pop and it's give balancing out the image quite a bit. 
So there is before, there's after. If it's a little too much, which in this case it is, I can actually just reduce the opacity of the layer to uh, right there. I like it right there. I think that looks super cool. Okay, but I do want to do a couple of finishing touches on this image in Lightroom. So let's flatten the image and then save it. Okay. All right, so here's the image in Lightroom. Uh, just gonna do a couple of finishing touches here. Uh, let's open up the radial gradient here and I'm gonna draw a big wide one right here. And essentially what I'm wanting to do is just add a little more contrast. So I'm gonna just bring down that. So it just, it's, it, it kind of gives it depth. I want as much depth as I can get in this image. And I'm feeling pretty good about this image. So here is where we started. Here's where we started. And here's where we finished. And I think that's a really, it's a really pretty image. I, and this location is just amazing. So, okay. Last thing on our little post-production to-do list here is I want to show you how to basically do the pixel shift or merge it in uh, Imaging Edge. So let's go ahead and, and right here is Imaging Edge right here. All you're gonna do everything in Viewer pretty much. You have Edit here too, and it kind of automatically opens. It's very kind of quirky when you install it you have remote viewer and edit. Um, I just recommend going to viewer, clicking start. Okay. And as you can see, it, uh, it just kind of opens it up. Like you have basically all the files on your computer on this left pane. So we're going to navigate to, um, I think there it is. Multi-shot. We're going to do two here, uh, because I, I tried this, I tested this out on one. <laughs> so we're going to do two here. So here's your 16 shots. We're going to select all right click on the first one and Create and adjust pixel shift multi-shot composite image. It's the second one from the top. You can just create it, um, but I recommend just doing it from the top one because then it opens it in the edit pane. You can work with it a little bit. So we want to stabilize the image if it contains a moving subject. Yeah, sure, we want to do that. All right, and now it's gonna do its thing for a couple minutes. All right, it's all done. Just click next. Now, Imaging Edge automatically opens its little edit app. Um, we can look at it. We can ooh and ah at it. And it's amazing. Super high res uh, image quality. But the main thing we wanna do is click the little export button up here. If you want to make edits in here, you can, but there's no real reason to. Uh, you want to do, this is important. You want TIFF file, 16-bit, and then change it to Adobe RGB. That is the settings that you want. And then we are going to put it in the same folder so that we can compare. Um, oh, it's in blue, there we go. Um, Multi-shot two, we're just gonna put it in the same folder so we can compare it. So you can see basically what you get. So now it's gonna export the TIFF, which is gonna take nearly as long as merging it in the first place. Okay, we are back in Lightroom with our 16 shots plus the multi-shot. 
the only way to tell without zooming in which one the multi-shot is, is to actually click on it and see that it's 240.9 megapixels. So significantly different megapixels. It also has, is a little bit corrected and has more color depth. You can tell that there's more color depth from the 16 bit. So that's the first thing. So let's go ahead and compare it to one of the 60 megapixel files. We'll zoom in and you can see how much more uh, resolution you're getting. And it's pretty cool. It's, it's actually awesome how much resolution you're getting. I would say this is, is sharp. I mean, it's legitimately adding a good amount of resolution. This image would print bigger. I also, like I said, I feel like you're getting more color information. Um, this just like, this isn't, these are both unedited raw files, but I feel like there's, there's more color tonality in the sky. The there's more color tonality in the water. The greens of the trees are a little richer. So is the pixel shift multi-shot worth it? I think in situations where you can set up on a tripod, it is totally is. Um, I think it's totally worth it. Especially if you um, kind of have set up your composition and you know you can experiment and use it. Would I be messing around with it if I was trying to get a hard to get shot? Probably not. And like in this situation, this shot is is nothing particularly special, right? Like, um, oh, and you can see over here, you have these people. Clearly, what it's done is it has isolated them. They are obviously lower res, but they were moving around. They're the same kind of probably res as this one. So yeah, I that's kind of the, the little movement compensation thing that it has. But overall, I would say this is a stronger image because of the pixel shift. Um, certainly would print better, probably have better color latitude. So it's a worthwhile process. I think if you have time and energy and all that stuff to deal with the, the extra of it, obviously the, the 60 megapixel files are plenty high resolution and good enough for, for most applications. I just think that like, there's probably situations where you probably like it. And like I said, the, the tonality in the sky and the water, like, I mean, that's really cool. Could I get this sky to look like that? Yeah, I probably could with some editing. But to have it be a starting place like that, and then like having that extra resolution, especially if I'm picturing this photo for a large print application, it's definitely worth it. So yeah, that's pretty cool. The pixel shift, I, uh, I like it more than I thought. At last, we have come to the end of the A7R5 guide to landscape photography. Thank you. If you have made it this far into the video, thank you. It has been a probably a marathon watch, hopefully filled with a lot of useful information. And we really appreciate you. If you have made it this far in this video, please subscribe. I think that this is obviously a channel that you would enjoy and get something from. So yeah, um, we're still a, a young growing channel and every like, every subscribe matters to us. And so, yeah, I like it. We really would appreciate it. We have a lot of stuff coming in the pipeline. Um, it's almost fall season in Colorado. We're going to be doing a lot of fall color shooting, a lot of adventures in the mountains that you're definitely going to want to be tuned in for. And yeah, I, I hope to be able to continue these camera guides. We already have one up for the Nikon Z8. Now we have the A7R5. And who knows what's next? I don't have one on the schedule. Um, let us know in the comments what camera guide you would like to see in the future. And hopefully we can make that happen. So, so with that, we will see you on the next adventure.